Hey everyone, I'm Roy Townsend, and I'm the Grove Pastor here at the River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do this is to text River Connect one word to 97,000, or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text an amount that you want to give to 84. 321, or you can visit our website and click on the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. It is good to see you this morning. Glad that you are able to join us. I want to welcome also those of you that are watching online. Thank you for being with us this morning. Well, we continue today in um, our series uh, we call The Upper Room. This is, of course, the words of the Lord Jesus on uh, the night before he was crucified. And uh, he gathered his disciples together around the dinner table and said some of the most important words that could ever be said. And I love that. If you're going to have a really serious conversation with me, I would love if you just gather me around a dinner table and we have that conversation. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so that's what he did. He gathered his disciples together. And uh, man, he said some things. And what we look at this morning is uh, one of the most moving parts of what he said to his disciples before he was crucified. And so I want you to see that. If you've got a Bible, uh, please open it up to the book of John chapter 15. My favorite chapters in the Bible. John chapter 15 is where we're going to be this morning. And... um, While you're turning there, I want to let you know that we will be uh, baptizing someone at the end of our gathering today after after our gathering is done. So if you're able to stick around and to celebrate that with us, please do so. And if the Lord is stirring your heart to be baptized because you have not yet been, this would be your opportunity to do that. And uh, we have everything you would need to be able to do that. So um, even if you didn't come prepared, that's okay. Well, let's read our passage this morning and then we'll pray and we'll ask the Lord to speak, okay? John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, Jesus, looking at his disciples, he says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. And neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus then makes it clear, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do a few things. Oh wait, it doesn't say that, sorry. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this morning, for the time that we are able to spend together. We thank you for your word. It is so precious. And we pray that this morning you would open our hearts to hear from you. Lord, you know every person in this room, you know every person watching, you know us, Lord. And you know what we need. We pray this morning that you would speak and you would help us to hear you. We look to you now, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you a question. It's a simple question, but it is difficult, actually, I've found to answer. The question is this. Do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? That is, as I said, a simple question, but not always so easy to answer. Let me ask it a little bit differently. Does the Lord have your heart? Or maybe for you it's your mind. (laughs) Maybe for you it's your strength, but he doesn't have your heart. Say, well, why are you asking this? Well, let me say it this way. Can you say today, could you say, I love you, Lord? Could you say that? The reason I'm asking this is because everything Jesus says this morning is dependent on that question. 
What I mean is, what Jesus says to us in this passage will mean nothing to the person who does not love him. Nothing. But to the person, in contrast, to the person who does love him, it will mean everything to the person who loves him. Let me just make this statement right from the start. One of the defining marks of being his, of belonging to him, you could say whatever phrase you want to say that is, right? Being saved, being Christian, knowing you'll go to heaven, you know, whatever that might be, right? Whatever term you want to use for dying and entering heaven, whatever that person is, a Christian, a saved person, whatever, the defining mark of that person is that we love him. It's a defining mark, is that we love him. His people love him. Let me say it this way. Saved people love the one who saved us. It is not about religion. It is not about a building. It is not about money. It is not about programs. It is not about control. It is not about religion. It is about him. It is knowing him, him knowing us. It is loving him, him loving us. It is relationship. Peter says this about Jesus in 1 Peter 1.8. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. This is true of all true Christians. We haven't seen him, but we love him. 1 Peter 2.7, it says, to you who believe, to you who believe, he, Jesus, is precious. Can I ask you, is Jesus precious to you? That means you love him. It goes on to say, but to those who are disobedient, he is rejected. They just deny and reject him. Jesus, looking at the religious leaders in John chapter 8, he said this in verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me. But they did not. They did not love him. And, and this, is a, this, is, this is a true mark of every true follower of Jesus Christ. Actually saved people, he loves us and we love him. And we love him, according to 1 John, because he first loved us, right? He won you with his love. And therefore, listen, our life, this is why we do what we do as Christians. If you are not a Christian here today, maybe you think, you know, we're super weird. And I get it. You want to know why we do what we do? Here it is. We come to church. Why? We ain't trying to earn anything. We already have it. We don't come to church to try to earn salvation. We already have salvation. We aren't trying to get anything from God. We already have everything. We have him. We don't need anything else. So why do we come to church? Because we love him. Because we love him. That's the very simple answer. We come together to worship him. Why? Not to keep salvation. We already have salvation. We come together to worship him because we love him. We sing to him because we love him. We give to him and we give to others because we love him. We serve and we give up our lives because we love him. We, we, we root out sin in our life and we repent and we reject evil in our lives and we stay away from things and we're careful in our lives. Why? Because we love him. Because he first loved us. We forgive offenses because he, loved him, because he loves us, we obey, we follow his word, we share the gospel. Whatever it is, we do this as a response to him loving us. We love him. This is not religion, folks. Religion kills everybody. It kills everybody. This is relationship. This changes everything. Jesus said this about the unsaved person in John 14, 24. And I would just ask you today, okay? A lot of what Jesus said and what we're looking at today is meant to test us. It is meant to, to validate what we actually are. And I would ask you to, to just honestly be open about God speaking to you and, and evaluating where you are. I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm examining my own heart as I go through this, right? But the things that he said, they were meant to... Wake them up, right? Like, oh no, maybe I'm not where I should be, okay? That's what he's doing. Well, John 14, 24, he says this, He who does not love me does not keep my words. What does it mean? Well, it means that the unsaved person has no interest 
in obeying God. No interest in pleasing God. Because they don't know Him. They don't love Him. Before I came to Jesus Christ, I did not care about what God wanted. I was a self-driven person. It was all about what I wanted. It was my will. It was my way. It was my plans. It was, it was me. It was all about me. I was the center of my universe. And guess what? I didn't know him. As soon as I came to know him, all of that changed. Now it's about him. It's about what he wants. It's about what he says. It's about what he wants me to do. As we come to John chapter 15 this morning, Jesus has gathered his disciples around the table. And in very simple terms, it's very moving, he looks at these guys and here's what he says. He says, stay close to me. We're going to talk about it a little bit more here in just a moment. But to help them understand, he begins with a picture. I know about you, my brain works best with pictures. If you give me like 24, you know, detailed things I got to remember, I'll be like, what was number two again, you know? But you draw me a picture and I'm like, hey, I got it. You know what I mean? So like, I got a pop-up Bible right here. It's really awesome. I just pulled a little, no, it'd be fantastic though, right? He gives them a picture to help them understand. And he begins with this picture of a tree or a, a vine. Here's what he says. I am the true vine. The word vine, he's referring to a, a grapevine in a vineyard. And it's a picture that God has used before. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was called the vineyard of the Lord. They were a nation of people that God planted and God tended and cared for. And the goal was that they would bear fruit in the world. What fruit? They were to be people that loved the Lord. They were to be the nation on earth that knew him and loved him and everything they did was for him and they pointed an unsaved, a lost world to him. It's what they were supposed to be. It's what you and I are supposed to be today. But of course, we read that Israel did not do that. In Isaiah chapter 5, it's, uh, it's uh, tragic, the words, but Isaiah chapter 5, the Lord describes what happened with Israel. He says this, he says, My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He, talking about the Lord, dug it up, he cleared it out, cleared out its stones, he planted it with the choicest vine. God planted the vineyard. He built a tower in its midst to protect it, is the idea. And he made a wine press in it because he expected there to be fruit. It goes on, it says, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But what happened? It brought forth wild grapes. It says, and the Lord asks, oh now, you know, ask now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could I have been, you know, what more could I have done? What more have, could, have, could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, God says, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? See, God had worked in their lives and worked in that nation and worked in those people. And instead of knowing him and loving him and following him, they rebelled against him. And they, they went into error and wickedness and sin and rebellion. And we read in verse 7 that the, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. They did not fulfill their role as the vineyard of the Lord, as the vine. But Jesus says here, I am the true vine. What he's saying is, is that he is the one who fulfills this role. He now perfectly points every unsaved person to the Lord for salvation. And I would say that today. Can you hear him this morning? If you don't know him, he is speaking. He wants you to turn. He wants you to come. There's another reason that Jesus tells us that he is the true vine. He wanted them and us to understand something that is very simple, but when you understand it, it changes everything in life. I know that's a big statement, but it's true. This changes everything in life when you understand this. He wants you and I to know where to find everything you actually need in life. He wants you to know where to find it. Everything you actually need. He wants you to know where that comes from. Listen, our world has no idea where it comes from. They don't know where to find love. They don't know where to find true peace. They don't know where to find joy and hope and purpose and meaning and fulfillment. They don't know where to get it. He wants us to be sure. 
where to find it. Jesus is making sure that his disciples, but also each of us, we know where to get everything we need in this life. And here it is, very simple. It's him. It's him. And him alone. You look anywhere else, you're going to be disappointed. It's not in church, it's not in religion, it's not in people, it's not in things, it's not in success, it's not in accomplishments, it's not in vacations, it's not in entertainment, it's not in anything. You can't order it off Amazon. What you need cannot be found in people. It can only be found in Him. What you need is in Him and Him alone. So He gives a picture this plant, and any plant has three basic parts, right? It has a, a root system, then it has, a, you know, vines or a branch or stalks or whatever, and then, and then, of course, those will produce either flowers or fruit. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is telling us that he and he alone is the root system. He is where everything comes from. He'll tell us in just a moment that we are the branches. He'll tell us to stay connected to him so that we bear fruit. Fruit only comes from staying connected to him. So here's what he says. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. We don't have time to go into it, but he basically says that his father is the gardener. God is the gardener in your life to make sure that you bear fruit. He pulls up weeds. We're going to see some of this in a moment. But he pulls up weeds and he waters and he tends and he he tries to make it so that you will bear more fruit. God is doing this. The Bible says it is God who works in you both to will and and to do according to his good pleasure. It is not us. We don't make ourselves fruitful. God does this in us. But from this very simple picture, we are supposed to learn, we are supposed to know where we look to get everything we need. It is him. He is the root. He is the supply. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2 tells us, Grace and peace be multiplied to you, in the knowledge of God and of, uh, of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power, watch this, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. It means we have everything we need in this life through him. Everything. If everything else went away and we only had Christ, we still have everything. So now that we know the picture... He begins to talk about the goal of, fr- uh, of, of planting anything, which is fruit, right? Nobody plants a vineyard and hopes that it just sits there taking up resources, right? It's not why you're out there watering and pruning and putting a fence around it. You, well, I hope I don't get anything this year. Last year, we got all kinds of crops. You know, this year, we'll just see what we can do to make sure we don't get anything, you know? That's not what it is. You're hoping for fruit. That's the goal. It's the goal of God as well for your life. Look at this, verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. If an apple tree does not produce apples, something is wrong. If an apple tree never produces apples, there's only two possibilities. It's either diseased or dead, right? Or it's not really an apple tree at all. You've been mistaken about it, right? I remember growing up and thinking we had a cherry tree in our yard in Southern California where cherry trees typically don't grow because it's a thousand degrees at all times, right? But I thought we had a cherry tree and I remember thinking one of these days cherries are going to grow on that tree until somebody came along and said, that's not a cherry tree, man. That's a big old weed. Can you imagine walking out there and being like, any day now, you know? <laughs> no, you mistook what it was. Listen, there's only two possibilities. If, if an apple tree is not bearing apples, it either is diseased or it's dead or it's not really an apple tree at all. And the same is true with any professing Christian. If a person professes to be a Christian but there is no fruit or evidence of being a Christian, there's only two possibilities. They're either diseased by sin or they are not really Christians at all. I told you this is meant to make us evaluate ourselves, right? 
The Christian that produces no fruit of Christ living in them is not really a Christian at all but is just one in name and not in reality. And this is why Jesus says, every branch in me, or that professes to be in me, that does not bear fruit, look what it says, he takes away. The word takes away is the word we would use for snipping off a branch and tossing it in the trash. It's the same word. It means to lift up and throw away. It describes what you do with a plant that, that is, you know, with a diseased branch, you cut that thing off before it infects the rest of it, or maybe it's taking up resources from the rest of the plant. You've got to trim that off, right? Because all it's doing is taking. It's not producing anything. Now here, Jesus is not talking about uh, plants. He's not talking about trees. He's talking about people, right? He's talking about people who say they are his people, but whose lives bear no fruit of being his people at all. They're either very, very diseased with sin, or they're simply not his people at all. And they've deceived themselves. They may have deceived others, but they will never deceive God, right? The Bible says all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God sees everything. So Jesus makes it clear here, What's happening, right? Asks us to evaluate. Now, before we move on, you got to pause and say, okay, Jesus is talking about fruit. What is he talking about? What is this fruit that we are supposed to be you know, bearing in our life? Well, when you boil down the New Testament, you see that there are three main fruits that grow in the life of every saved person, okay? These three fruits, they grow in the life of every saved person, and they do not grow in the life of an unsaved person, okay? So these are three evidences that you actually are in Christ, okay? Watch. The first is this, repentance from sin. That's the first one. It's the fruit of repentance. That's the first one. And it, and it proves that you actually are in him by repenting of sin. This is the thing that the, the non-saved person, the unsaved person does not do. They don't repent to God for sin. They might feel bad about consequences, but they don't turn to God in repentance for forgiveness for sin. And by the way, this is um, what we do as Christians. We repent over our sin. Sin bothers me. I want to be perfect. I will not be perfect this side of heaven, but I want to. And I see some of you nodding your heads. Don't we wish we could be because we would please the Lord? This doesn't come out of you know, needing to be saved. I'm already saved. I want to please him with my life. I wouldn't want to say another thing that displeases him. I wouldn't want to do another thing that displeases him. I want to please the Lord. I repent over sin regularly. By the way, this is something that John the Baptist said would prove that a person is more than just a talker. Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, John was baptizing people in the Jordan there, and uh, people were repenting. They were turning to the Lord. They were being baptized. I mean, very moving scene, I'm sure. People were leaving the city. They were walking out. I mean, just tears streaming down their faces. They're being baptized in repentance. But of course, here come the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They're in their robes and their pride. And, you know, here we are. We're in charge, you know. And John doesn't go, oh, finally, some spiritual authority. Come on over and share with us. That's not what he says. Here's what he says. When he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you bunch of snakes. That's not very welcoming, John. That's not very loving. You bunch of snakes, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Then look what he says in verse 8. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Repent. That will prove that you are not just a talker. Repentance is we feel sorry for sin. It, it bothers us and it pushes us to God in repentance. Second fruit, okay, so the first one is repentance of sin. Second fruit that is proof of, of, of being saved is this, he is actually Lord of our lives. This is a second fruit in the life of any person who's actually in him. A saved person has Jesus Christ as Lord over their life. This means that we want what he wants. We do what he says. 
Again, not because we're trying to earn anything, not because we're trying to get anything, but because he's Lord, because he's master. Whatever he says is what we want to do. Whatever he tells us to do, is that, that's our command. He is our king. He is our Lord. The Bible says we have to be really careful because there are, there are people that have an outward form of godliness. They can talk the talk. They can say all the facts. They can tell you all the things. They can explain stuff in here. It says they have an outward form of godliness, but they deny the power of it in their own life. It has no power over them. They, they don't repent of sin. They don't turn from sin. They don't turn to God. They don't obey God. They don't follow God. They don't want God's will. They're still self-driven people, though they know a lot about this. Got to be so careful. The, the evidence that you are actually in him is that he's really Lord. And that'll show itself because many times you'll read this and you'll go, oh, wow, I need to change. I need to be doing uh, very differently than I'm doing, right? Well, as Lord, we want to please him. So that's the second fruit is that he is Lord. The third fruit, the third evidence that you're actually saved is this. We said it at the beginning. You love him. You love him. Now listen, this isn't just loving the idea of Jesus. There's a lot of people that love the idea of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, he's so sweet. He's so kind. He's so nice. I love Jesus. Jesus is my homeboy. You know, I hate all that stuff. I'm like, oh my dear Lord, I cannot imagine standing in front of God Almighty, the sovereign King of heaven, put everything into its existence and be like, what's up, my homeboy? That's so stupid. So stupid. Listen, we don't just love an idea of him. We love him. The fruit of being his is not, you know, that you know, you, you like this idea of a nice Jesus. You love the Jesus of the scriptures, right? There were people that were following him until he told them that they needed to, you know, repent of their sin and turn. Otherwise, you know, hell was what was coming. And they were like, whoa, hold on a second. That's not the Jesus we believe. Talking to Jesus, you know. <laughs> Hang on there, Jesus. That's a little bit judgy, you know. No, no, listen, right? We actually love him. He's the love of our life. Can I ask you that? Is he the love of your life? Do you love him more than you love anyone else? Let's do it, bro. Jesus said this, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's strong. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. This is even stronger. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I love my kids and I love my wife, but I love him above them because of what he's done, because of who he is. You know, one of the ways to see what fruit we're supposed to be bearing in our life is by looking at what the opposite would be. The opposite is given to us in Galatians 5. It says this, the works of the flesh, of the unsaved, of the ungodly, here they are. They're, they're evident. They're easy to see. Here they are. It's being okay with. We could add that. It's being okay with or excusing or condoning. Watch this. Adultery. The unsaved world. What's adultery? That's just your old-fashioned opinion about things, right? Fornication. Come on, man. Sexual sin. You guys are so stuck in the mud, man. Move on. Right? Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresy, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. He says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, this is not referring to those of us that, that struggle with certain things. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the unsaved world condones all of these things. They excuse all of these things. They're fine with all of these things. These aren't... These, what, adultery? Come on. No big deal. Sexual sin? Whatever. Hatred? They deserved it. I gave them a piece of my mind. Selfishness? I'm just looking out for number one. Jealous of others? Just excuse. Saying things that divide people? What's the big deal? Right? These, are the, these are the rotten fruits that come from being unsaved. 
Man, but Galatians goes on, verse 22, and tells us what the fruit of being alive is. The fruit of the Spirit, it says, of being saved is this, love, real love, not love that takes from you. It's selfless, right? Real love, it's joy. How do you get that? It's peace, it's long-suffering, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Bottom line, you are in great danger today if you are not bearing the fruits of Christ. If you do not love him, let this be a siren of warning to you. If you do not repent of sin, but rather excuse it, let this be a siren of warning to you. You don't know if you'll take your last breath today. You don't know. If you do not want to please him with your life, if you just have an outward form of religiousness, but there's really no power, this book has no power, you must turn to Christ in repentance. Let me warn you, before it's too late, you're in great danger. Now, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, not only are you going to bear fruit, this is a blessing, Hey, you're going to bear fruit, but he's also going to work in your life to help you bear more fruit. Watch this, end of verse 2. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, you might not like this, but God is going to prune your life so that you bear more fruit. Okay? Now, here, now, I know you know, right? If you know the Lord, you know this. But listen, pruning is a very important process in the life of any plant in its fruitfulness. The pruning process is fascinating and essential It's the process of cutting off branches so that you can focus the resources towards specific branches so that they bear good fruit, right? This is the process of pruning. My wife and I, um, a few years back, we were golfing on a golf course that had apple trees on it, and it was fall, my favorite time of year, and uh, I'm a terrible golfer, but I didn't care. I just wanted to be on the golf course. It was really fun. And you smell the apples. I mean, it just smelled like apples in the air, and then somebody was throwing cinnamon around. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But it was just, it was incredible, and you thought, man, these apples smell so good, and I was hungry, because, you know, I'm always hungry, right? So um, I was was hungry, and so I was like, I could not wait to to eat one of these apples, and you looked, and you saw this, these trees all along the golf course, and they were just full of apples, tons of apples all over. I walk up, and I, I grab one, and I go, before I go to eat it, I notice it's like rotten. It's like got holes and weird shapes and things. I was like, oh, okay, throw that one aside. So grab another one, you know. Go to take a bite. Whoa, this one's even worse than the last one. Grab another one. Really, really bad. Finally decide, you know what, I'm going to just try it. Even though I found one that kind of sketchy, but like, we'll just take a bite. That's how desperate I was. I know, I know. Right, so I, and I, and I took a bite, and I was like, oh, gosh, that's so bitter. It's gross. Just like, just awful, Right? That's when I learned you got to prune trees like that if you want good fruit from them, right? Because you can't just take all the nutrients, just spread it to everything. There's not enough to, to, to really produce good fruit. Listen, the same process is true in our lives. The Lord does this to you and I. He'll prune away the things that are needlessly taking up your resources so that you can put those resources into the right things. And he does this so that you'll produce more fruit. You'll become more and more like Christ. Just like with any vineyard, pruning is essential. Maybe you're in a process of it right now. Someone said that to me after the first gathering. I said, how you been? How you doing? I'm in a season of pruning. I said, oh yeah, welcome to the club, you know. There's no t-shirts. We don't get any t-shirts, but you know, we're, we're all in the club. Are you in this season of pruning right now? Rejoice. Why? Because it's for your growth. You ever been in a season of pruning where God took away things? You go, man, nothing's working out, or I lost my job, or man, stuff is so hard, money's gone, success is gone, accomplishments are gone, like my importance, my contributions, my all these things, everything's gone. What's, what's going on? Well, do you love him? Yeah, I love him. Well, then chill out. Relax. He's just pruning. You're like, well, that's not very loving. It's not very compassionate. Just relax. He's just trying to bear more fruit in your life. 
It might be activity. Well, you know, I used to do this thing and do that thing, and then God really convicted me. I mean, it was taking a lot of my time, and, you know, now I actually see my family. Oh, awesome. Like, thank God for his pruning, right? I used to have this app on my phone. It sucked up all my hours, you know, so God told me to delete that. Good. Follow the voice of the Lord. Let him prune those things away. He's trying to put attention into the right stuff. It might, might even be people. Yeah, you know, every time I'm around these people, they pull me from the Lord. It's a distraction. They push me, you know, in the wrong ways. God says, no, no more. I don't want you around those people anymore. It might be some hobby. I mean, just think about it. Like God is pruning things away, and the goal of this is that you would bear good fruit. Now, the guys, no doubt, at this point, were freaked out. Okay? Let's go back to the table. Here they are. They're like, what just happened, right? Are we bearing good fruit? Are we not bearing good fruit? Like, what are you trying to say to us, right? He assures them in verse 3. Here's what he says. You, looks at them, he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The point that Jesus makes here is so important. He tells them, his disciples, you are already clean. Guys, you're already forgiven. You're already saved because of the word which I have spoken to you. They, are, they were saved, right? But they were saved how? By their belief in what he said to them. This is how they were saved. Just as you and I are, we've been saved by our believing in who he is and in what he said he did, in, in who he is, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is how they were saved. But it's really important that you pause right here and realize that Jesus was not telling these guys. It's so important you hear this. He was not telling these guys to bear fruit so that they could be saved. He was not saying that. He was not say, saying, guys, bear fruit so that you will be saved. Bearing fruit cannot save you. They were already saved. Jesus was not telling them to obtain salvation by doing good things. That is impossible. Salvation does not come from doing good things. It doesn't come from going to church. It doesn't come from giving. It doesn't come from being selfless. It doesn't come from helping people or volunteering or any of those things. It, salvation does not come from any of those things. What Jesus is saying is that when a person is saved, then they do those things. They bear fruit. We don't bear fruit to be saved. We bear fruit because we're saved. Does this make sense? Have I confused the daylights out of everybody? Okay. Saved people bear fruit. It's what we do. So again, if you back up to the picture of the apple tree that never produces apples, you go, if saved people bear fruit, what is an apple tree that never bears fruit? We don't know. What is that? The idea of a, a Christian that does not bear Christ-like fruit is foreign to the Bible. We don't know what that is. But I'll tell you what, it's a pandemic problem in America. Where we say, yeah, I mean, I go to church, or I went to church, or I got baptized when I was a baby, or I, I prayed one time, or I, you know, whatever, I go on Christmas, or I go on Easter, or whatever, and people think that they are Christ followers because of that? That's crazy. That's like saying I read a book about Abraham Lincoln, and I know everything about him, and so I must have been his best friend. That's weird, but people have that idea. Well, I saw The Chosen, so I'm pretty much in. <laughs> no, you're not. Not unless you know him, and more importantly, not unless he knows you. The point that Jesus is making is saved people bear fruit. They do. So now talking to them as his disciples, talking to you and I, verse 4, look what he says, abide in me and I in you. This is will blow your mind because Jesus says, stay close to me. Stay close. He says, remain with me. And I, I want you to try to put yourself at the table this morning, okay? I want you to try to sit there and I want you to try to imagine that Jesus is looking at you. And I want you to imagine that he has just told you that you're saved, okay? Because you believe. But then he looks into your eyes and he says, now stay close to me. What does this mean? What is he saying? He says, uh, remain with me. Be here. Stay close. Let me be clear what he's not doing. He's not saying, stay saved. Not what he's saying. 
He just told them they were saved. He's not saying, guys, uh, keep yourself saved, okay? By staying close to me, you'll keep yourself saved. That is not what he's saying. The Bible says that Jesus promised us as his people that he would never leave us nor forsake us. There's not a moment he leaves you, if you've trusted him, there's not a moment he's not with you. Not a moment he leaves you, not a moment he has forsaken you. Not a moment. The Bible actually also goes further than this, makes it clear that not only when you come to him, not only does he come into you, but you're actually put in him. How much closer can you be? He makes his home inside of you. So when he says these things, when he looks at you and says, stay close to me, what's he saying? What could Jesus possibly mean by telling us to remain near him? This is a request of love. It's a request of love. This is what a husband says to a wife. Stay by my side. Stay by near me. Be mine. Be devoted to me. This is what a wife says to her husband. Give yourself to me completely. Be real. Be vulnerable. Be near me. Be connected to me. This is what the Lord Jesus is doing. He's looking into each of their eyes, but he's looking into yours and mine. And here is what he's saying. Stay close to me. Be near to me. It's a request that comes from love. And it's what the Lord has always said He wanted from us. This is what He's always wanted, folks. He doesn't want, you know, it's not been about buildings and churches and money and all the things we've talked about. It's never been about those things. He didn't want any of this stuff. From the very beginning, He says it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The first commandment was this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. He could have said anything to you, but he said, love me. It's like, again, like a husband looking into his wife's eyes, or a wife looking into her husband's eyes, or a a parent to their child. Stay close to dad. I used to do this with my kids, right? We go into a busy, busy area, you know? You've done this, right? You look at your child and you say, hold my hand, stay next to me, right? Right? It's their protection. I'm their safety. I mean, this is what the Lord is doing. He's looking into our eyes today. It's not just theology. This is love. And he's saying, stay close to me. Stay near. This is what God has always wanted. He could have said, you shall serve the Lord your God. As every other religion really is, guys. Just so you know. Every other religion, that's what it is. You shall serve God effectively. You shall give to God faithfully. You shall be this. You shall do that. Every single other false religion in the world says do this and live. Christianity is the only one. He looks at you and says, love me because I love you. Love me. And by the way, this is, again, why we do everything we do. He loves us, and so we, we love him. By the way, when you, when you read, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, that means with your entire person. Can you see this? Can you see Jesus looking at you and saying this, stay close to me? And then he promises you, he says, um, abide in me, I will abide in you. I will remain in you. And again, this isn't talking about salvation because we already know. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. This is him saying, you draw near to me. Watch what happens. I will draw near to you. You, you, you want to be close to me? I will be close to you. I'm as close. This is sometimes hard to think about. The Lord is as close to you as you want him to be. So if there's distance, what does it say? It just says that you don't care. There's no priority. I know that, that's harsh, right? But it's reality. It just says other things have been more important. He says, uh, abide in me and I in you. Watch, this connection is so important because the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. 
If you go back to the illustration and you cut a branch off of an apple tree, it's got a little flower on it. You cut the branch off, leave it on the ground, let it just sit there. Somebody should write a book about that. <clears throat> it will never produce an apple. It just won't happen. That branch has to be connected to that tree to produce an apple. It's the only way it's going to happen. And the same is true for you and I. Jesus says, neither can you unless you abide in me. You realize a person cannot bear the fruit that we need to bear on our own. We cannot do this. No one can bear the fruit of Jesus Christ apart from being connected to Jesus Christ. You cannot by your effort, you cannot by your, your cleaning yourselves up or your, your church attendance or by doing good things, hear the words, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You cannot bear fruit apart from Jesus Christ. Not only can you not be saved apart from Jesus Christ, you cannot be, but you also cannot bear fruit apart from Jesus Christ. And I would ask you this morning, what fruit do you need to bear? I have looked into the eyes of people who know they cannot do that thing one more time. If they do it, it is going to destroy their life. It's going to kill them. How do you stop doing it? Doubling down on your promise and your effort? It's through Jesus Christ. It is through weakness and admitting and running to him and clinging to him. That is how we do it. The branch cannot bear fruit. What do you need? Do you need love for others? It only comes through him. Do you need joy in life? It only comes through Christ. Do you need peace in these crazy times? It only comes through Jesus. Do you need patience? Do you need self-control? It is only through his power. Just try and do these things on your own and you'll see how fruitless it is. It is not possible to bear fruit apart, apart from him because he is the source. Look at this, verse 5. He just makes it really plain. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Jesus says, stay close to me, stay near me, and you will bear fruit. Let me say it this way. Closeness to Jesus equals fruit Closeness to Jesus equals fruit, and it also equals change. You want to be a different person? Draw near to Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Talk to him. Listen to him. Read of him. Pray to him. Worship him. Sing to him. Let your heart connect to him. You shall start to bear fruit. You shall start to become a different person because of your nearness to him. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, as we close our time together this morning, we have to look at verse 6, which is a warning. Jesus gives it to us. He warned constantly about this. He said, if anyone does not abide in me, this is a person who refuses the Lord. They refuse Christ. They refuse to abide in him. Watch. If, if anyone does not abide in me, what happens? He is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. There are real and eternal consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ. They are real, and Jesus warned us about them constantly. This is mind-boggling to me. To reject God, first of all, is the height of arrogance. Because we're not God. I haven't been everywhere. How in the world can I say there is no God when I haven't been everywhere to, to be able to say that? It is such arrogance, right? But He is God. We are not. To deny Him when He is God over all things, when He made us and we did not make ourselves, we know this, we're not God. To, to deny the One who is infinitely powerful and holds all things together by the Word of His power. To deny Him as little tiny human being. To be, I hate you, God is beyond comprehension. And then, not only is, are we talking about God, the sovereign over all things, that we as this microscopic little person are denying and shouting against, but then not only that, but he loves that little microscopic person. He loves us. He came himself and died in our place. 
to give us a way to be saved. To deny that. And then according to the Bible, he spends all day trying to convince you that he loves you and that you need him. And then to be like, I don't need anything. To reject that, it's unthinkable after all that he has done. To refuse to abide in him is to choose to die. Listen, God does not send people to hell. People often say that. How can a good God send people to hell? Good God sent himself into this hell. And he died himself in our place. With our sin upon himself, he allowed us to beat and mutilate him and kill him. That's what he allowed. That's what God did. That's what the good God did. He came and made a way. How can God send people to hell? He does not send people to hell. People send themselves. What more could God have done? We go back to the vineyard at the beginning. What more could I have done in this vineyard? What more could I have done in this world? I didn't send an angel. I came myself. And I submitted myself to to you. To reject him. Unbelievable. Listen, you know what eternity is? Eternity is just where we get what we wanted most for for all of eternity. If, If we love him, guess what we get? Him. That's what heaven is. You want to know who I love most? I love him. Guess who I get for all eternity? Him. But if you reject him and you choose yourself your whole life and reject him and refuse him, then guess what? For eternity, you get what you wanted most. What did you want most? A godless existence. It's called hell. And it is beyond imaginable how bad it is. The only way you could even start to understand how bad hell is is to understand it's the opposite of who God is. You understand? Let me, let, let, let's be serious for just a moment about this. There is not one moment of happiness in hell. There will not be one, not one moment of happiness I want you to think about this for a moment. Not one moment of happiness because there is no happiness apart from the Lord. There is not one moment of laughter. There will not be one moment of purpose, of hope, of of fulfillment, of joy. There won't be a moment of rest And there won't be a moment when it stops. It goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And you say, how could God send people to hell? God does not send people to hell. God made a way. And to reject it is to choose it. And you say, well, well, God should just override all of that. Really? And force every person into an existence for all eternity that they did not want? That's the very thing God won't do. He will not override your will. He will not force you. You must choose. We all have a choice. We all must choose. And it is in this life where we make this choice. You say, okay, well, what do I do? Turn to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It's not too late. It's not too late. Today, If you can hear his voice, today you can turn to him. Today you can repent. Today you can be saved. Here's the question. Do you have him? Does he have you? Do you have him? Does he have you? I'm going to give you an opportunity. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for being so good to us. Lord, I pray for every true follower of Christ in this room, watching online, wherever it may be, Lord, I pray you would help us to draw near to you. Closer and closer every day. Connected. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I know that there are those who do not know you, who have realized today that they don't know you, they don't love you, they don't repent of sin, they don't want what you want, they, they have realized today that they 
are driven by themselves and not by you being Lord over their life. They've realized it today and they, they need to be saved. I pray, Lord, you'd help them now to turn to you. Is that you? Has the Lord convinced you of your need? If that's you this morning, right where you're sitting with every head bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, I'm asking you just to lift up your hand. You're saying, God, this is me. I need salvation to do what so many have done before and say, this is me. I need you, Lord. I need forgiveness. I need salvation. I turn to you. Just lift up your hand right where you're at. God sees. This is a moment where your, your hand is connected to your heart and God knows that. You're admitting your need. And now we talk to him because he's listening. Just talk to Jesus Christ. He's already listening to you and, and say, I'm willing I'm willing to turn to you this morning. I'm willing to come to you to receive life. I ask you for the forgiveness of my sin. I ask you to come and be Lord and King over my life. Just ask him for his forgiveness. Ask him to come and be King and Lord and Savior of your life. Give him your life now as so many of us have done. Lord, here is my life. It belongs to you. You paid for it at the cross. Here it is. Help me to follow you now. Lord, I thank you so much for your great love for us. Lord, we honor you. We lift up your name. We exalt you. We point to you as King, Shepherd, Savior, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.